are you guys doing? Good? No? Yes? Okay, good. All right, just checking. So today's talk, I called it Letting Go of Who I Think I Am. And I think that as I go along, you're going to notice why I did that. Okay? We're going to be talking about how, you know, when the wall of fears and worries comes up, when change is upon us, and, and it starts to freak us out a little bit, what I'm hoping that you're going to see from the talk is that it's just an obstacle that we must pass through on the journey towards self. And I mean self with a capital S, like the higher self. Self-realization, realizing who we really are. And as you know me, I like to ask a lot of questions. I always start my journeys with a question. And the question that I asked this time was, what are we? And that came up from a conversation that I was having with a friend who had recently lost a loved one. And they were just kind of sharing with me that the person came to them in a dream, and they kind of came to, she felt that she, the person came to say goodbye. You know, and that's kind of her, her intuitive feeling was that she came to say goodbye. And also to let her know that she was okay. But there was a time period. It, it didn't happen right away. They had, a few months had gone by. And so she, we just started talking how, like, what happens when, when we die? And what happens, what does the soul go through something? Some kind of uh, uh, transformation even after you die. And, and so we just started talking back and forth. And so we were like, what happens when you die? And so I told her, I was like, it depends on what you believe we are. You know, what are we? And so I, I feel that there's two perspectives. There's one that says that we're human beings in search of a spiritual awakening. Or that we're spiritual beings that are divine, that are eternal, dealing with a temporary human awakening. And so that's where our duality lies. Because your life experience, the one that you're going to have, is going to depend entirely on which one of those two perspectives, number one, you believe, and then you choose to live your life from. Okay? So I want to share with you, oh, before that, both of those perspectives, one of them is of the ego. The other one is of the spirit. One of them is of the truth, and the other one is the illusion. Okay? So keep that in mind. I'm going to refer to the illusion and the truth throughout the talk. Exactly. There you go. Yep, you're tracking. <laughs> so then, I want to share with you guys the story of Moses and the people of Israel. Just because I feel that this story is going to help illustrate what I'm trying to say. Now, as I know most of us know the story. The people of, Mo the people of Israel, they were, they were slaves. Their children were slaves. They were in bondage to Egypt for 400 years, right? And along comes Moses, sent by God, and he won their freedom. And so what I find interesting about this story is that he freed them. He took them on this journey, arduous journey, challenging, uncomfortable, uncertain. They didn't know where they were going. And they began complaining. They began complaining to the point that they wanted to go back. And so I asked myself, is the journey towards freedom that much more difficult than 400 years of bondage and slavery? Is that really true? And so... We can look at that story from the same two perspectives. We can say, this is a story of human suffering and struggle, right? Or, this is a story of transformation. And I want to tell you real quick, I want to spend a few seconds talking about the difference between change and transformation. So you see this paper, right? is change, right? But the essential quality remains the same. When it comes to transformation, 
nothing of the old remains. It's renewed. Okay? So that's really, really key, that it renews. So back to the story. Let's assume that the story is simply just a metaphor for individual growth and transformation. In this story, Egypt will represent our ego. And by the way, the ego is the oldest slave master in history. I mean, it's been around for a long time. So that means that any human aspect of ourselves that has any control over us, it's enslaving us. It's our Egypt. So let's assume that we're living from the, first per- the second perspective, that we're spiritual beings, right, dealing with a temporary human experience, a human awakening. So that means that our journey is a spiritual one. If we're spiritual beings dealing with a human experience, that means our journey is a spiritual one. And the moment that our journey becomes challenging, uncomfortable, uncertain, we start to complain, right? We fight it. The ego wants to resist it. We begin to want to go back to what it was, okay? We want to return back to what we've known, to what we've grown used to, just like the people of Israel did. Their journey became uncertain. Their journey became challenging, uncomfortable, and they wanted to go back. And that's because if you, if you pay attention to your life, at times of conflict, in times of personal stress, we revert, revert back to our old habits, okay? We want to go back to our own personal Egypt. But why, why do we do that? Because the ego needs something to hold on to so that it knows that it's safe, so that it knows that it's comfortable, that it's going to be okay. And that goes back to the duality that I was talking about earlier, the two perspectives. Either you're a human being in search of a spiritual awakening or you're a spiritual being having a temporary human awakening, right? A part of us is constantly building walls, walls of comfort, walls of safety. And another part of us is trying to obliterate them, to break free from them. And that's exactly what transformation is. It's freedom. Liberation from the enslavement of our former selves, an aspect of us that is keeping us in bondage. It's, the ult- it's letting go. It's really what it boils down to is letting go. Letting go of something that we're holding on to. Usually, again, an aspect of ourselves that is controlling us, that is keeping us comfortable, that is keeping us safe, preventing us from growing. Again, we, and we hold on to it because of that same reason. Because it's safe, it's comfortable, it's what we've known, it's what we're used to. There's certainty there. Okay? And we don't want to let go because letting go is painful. We do everything we can to avoid pain. Everything we can. And speaking of letting go, in that same conversation that I was having with that, with that person... As, as, as the conversation went along, I started talking about the show Lost. Did anybody see that show Lost? Yeah? You saw that? Good show, right? Great show. There's a lot of uh, controversy about the end. Some people didn't like the end. Some people did. You know, I thought it was great. But I was listening to my Pandora station, and a, a piano song came on that I thought that I had heard before. So I Googled the song, and it, sure enough, it was the theme song uh, it was called Life and Death for, like, the death scenes and those sad parts in Lost, okay? And so in YouTube, all along the side, you know how I suggest you certain videos? There was one video that said, the end of Lost explain. So I was like, okay, let's go see what this is about because maybe it'll teach me something that I didn't get from the show. And, but what it was, it was just a bunch of pictures. It was just running the pictures 
of the death of the characters. And I'm not going to give you any spoilers. Okay? If you haven't seen the show, I won't. You know that they die. It's obvious. Okay. But in the, in the show, it gives you, um, like, this person died at this moment. Like the scenes where they died, they let go. This person died at this moment in the show. They let go. These two people died together at this moment. They let go together. This person haven't, hasn't let go yet. This person let go at the moment they accepted their death. So they just keep saying that, let go, let go, let go. And it just got me thinking that death is the ultimate letting go. But then what does that say about life? That we're holding on to life because we don't want to let go. We hold on to all our experiences. We hold on to our husbands and our wives and our children and our jobs and our cars and our houses and our stuff and our positions and our titles. Right? We hold on to our money. We're constantly holding on to because we don't want to let go. But that's exactly what's going to happen at the end. We're going to let go. And I thought that was really interesting how they showed that. So here's what happens to us. We experience a loss. So any change that you're going through is going to boil down to a loss. You're losing something. Something's changing, then therefore you're losing something, right? And it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be uncertain, very uncertain. So then fears are going to come up. All kinds of fears and assumptions, really. You're going, to, you're going to start going, oh, my God, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. It's going to be the worst thing of my life. All kinds of fears come up. And then we begin to resist what is happening. We start resisting. And then we experience pain. Then we're calling it painful. And this is all kind of happening at the same time. It may go in a certain order. For, for the, it just happens randomly at the same It's different for everybody. But where do we actually experience the pain? Is it in the situation itself? It's really in our minds. We experience the pain in our mind because the pain is directly tied to our belief or our thoughts about how the current experience that is currently changing should be. Our belief or our thoughts about how this situation that is currently changing should be. So that means that what is happening right now is conflicting with what I think it should be happening. That's really all that's happening. What is happening right now is going against, it doesn't match what I have in my mind that it should be. And that's where the conflict is at. So then what do we really have to let go of? What needs to change then? It's our beliefs. It's our thoughts. It's our mindset. Because it's limiting us. It's changing for a reason. It no longer works. It's outdated. Okay? And it's, it means that up to that point, your thoughts have been rooted in the illusion and not in the truth. You're struggling with it because of that, because you're seeing it for the, you're looking at the illusion, you're not looking at the truth. And I'm gonna explain what I mean right now. They say the body is the vessel of the soul, okay? And you don't have a soul, you are a soul, okay? So the body is the vessel of the soul. So if the soul is the truth of who you are, then that means the body is the illusion. It's just the vessel. Our experiences work the same way. They're just a vessel of truth that are going to lead to a transformation. They're bringing to you a message. They're bringing you a truth that you need to see so that you can transform, so that you can experience freedom, so that you can liberate yourself from the enslavement of your former self. Okay? Something that is controlling you, something that is limiting you, something that is keeping you in bondage. 
that is not allowing you to see the truth of who you are. And so here comes this experience that we're calling it painful, that we're calling it struggle, that we're calling it challenging. But what is it really doing? We're believing that the experience is the truth. Instead of believing that the truth isn't what, the, what it's trying to show you. The truth is in the message. The truth is in the lesson, not in the experience. There's a monk, and I've, I've talked about him before. He says there's always honey in every circumstance. Find the honey. Stop focusing on how it looks or how it came to you. The vessel doesn't matter. Sometimes the vessel's going to look pretty ugly. Well, this is not how I wanted the honey to come. Well, so what? There's honey there. Find the truth. So in order to experience a transformation, that means I have to let go of who I think I am or who I thought who I am up to that point. I have to let go of all thoughts. I have to let go of limiting beliefs. My mind has to be renewed. Talked about that earlier. Nothing of the old remains. It has to be renewed. And as we begin to accept the change, as we begin to kind of like ease into it, and we begin to transform our lives and our experience, we're going to experience true fulfillment. Fulfillment that is associated with the joy that comes as a result of a transformation, of your mind being renewed, okay? And what we have to understand that as we go through this journey, we're going to be tested. You're going to get to the point like, yes, I've changed. I'm better. Okay. <laughs> Here's going to come something again that's going to test to see if you've actually learned what you said you learned. Even in school, you took a class, you learned some things. How do you know you learned? If you pass the test. If you don't pass the test, then you didn't learn. That's the normal way of learning. <laughs> But it's similar, to, it's similar in our life. If the test comes and you pass it, you don't have to get an A. You can get a C. Maybe you failed the last time it happened. And then this time you get a C. And the next time it comes around again, then maybe you get a B. So you're working up to the A. Okay? It's okay if you don't get an A every single time. You know? Just work up to it. So as we get tested, we're going to be doubting. Ah, you know, the ego loves to inject doubt. Right? And so that's why I say that part of the problem or a big part of the problem or our struggle is in our faith or our lack of faith, I should say. Because what is faith? If you Google faith, it's going to say complete trust. It's a knowing beyond doubt that things are working out as they should be. That what is happening right now is for my highest good. We have to trust in the truth that we are, not in the illusion, in the truth that we are, that this is bringing us a truth that's going to help me realize who I am. And I see this time and time again. I see this with myself at times. I see this with clients. I see this with patients that I see. They believe, we believe, that everything is happening for a reason. We believe that all things are working together for good. Consciously, we believe that. When it comes down to it, we don't. We don't trust it. We doubt it. We go right back into the complaining and what's happening to us. And this is struggle and this is painful because we're not trusting. We're not having faith. And that's what creates the struggle. That's where the struggle is at. Last week or two weeks ago, Jody talked about the struggle is not real. That's because it's not. The struggle will be real if you're focusing on the illusion, if you're focusing on the circumstances. But if you focus on the truth that the circumstances are bringing you, then the struggle is not real. It's an illusion. So instead of, of accepting and allowing this change to happen, to take place, we resist it. We fight it. That's where the struggle is at, right? We're not trusting that what is coming, what is happening right now, doesn't matter how it looks like, I'm not going to deny it. There's some things that are pretty hard to accept. But we can trust that it's for our highest good, 
Because it always is. It always is. So that means that we're not seeing the truth. I keep saying that. We're not seeing the truth. We're not seeing the truth that this experiences, that we're perceiving as struggle, as pain, as suffering. They're simply just the hardships, the challenges, the tests, the obstacles that we must overcome, pass through, to be able to rise to a higher level of being while we're here on this incarnation. Do we have to live like humans? Or can we have a human experience knowing that our truth comes from our spirituality? Can we live from that perspective rather than living from this human perspective and we're just trying to plug in to moments of spirituality? Okay? And that's, that's what's going to get us to a higher level of being when we realize the truth that who we are. But that takes transformation. That takes letting go of all thoughts, letting go of limiting beliefs. That takes your mind to be renewed, okay, so that you can experience that higher level of being and the joy that is associated with that level of being. Again, is the liberation from the enslavement of your former selves, okay? It's the realization of who you really are. So if you can break free, from the chains of the ego, then you will experience transformation and you will experience freedom. And before I hand it up the mic to Audrey, I want to leave you with this affirmation that when I was going through my lowest moment in my life, helped me so much. And I still give this to clients to help them through it. If you have a pen, you can write it down. If not, I'll, I can share it on Facebook. It says, it's, I call it the I am safe affirmation. It says, all is well in my world. Everything is working out for my highest good. Out of this situation, only good will come. I am safe. All is, world. All is well in my world. Out of this situation, only good will come. Everything is working out for my highest good. I am safe. Okay? And that's what you have to trust. That's what you have to have faith in, in the truth of who you are. And that everything that's happening to you is helping you realize that. Everything. Okay? And without any further notice, I would like to bring up my friend Audrey. She's not only a friend, she's a colleague, and she's a fellow wedding officiant with me. In fact, she's the one that hired me. She's like, I want to bring you on. This is Audrey Henry, everybody. So before we get started, um, I'm experiencing a pretty profound transformation in my life right now. And so to share this, it requires me to be, to be of an open heart. And so if you'll join me for just a second, those of you who are willing, um, if you'll just close your eyes and put your hands over your heart for a minute. And take a deep breath in with me. Send your love out and allow it to circulate this room and this world. Thank you. That was mostly for me, but hopefully, hopefully you liked it too. <laughs> um, so like I said, it's good to be here with you today. I want to start by telling you uh, why it's significant that I'm here and sharing this particular story of transformation. When Angel asked me if I would come and share, share a story of transformation, without hesitation, I was like, sure, I've been wanting to speak at The Connection for a while. Um, but in, and I've gone through many changes, as all of us have. Um, and my process in getting through it and navigating those is usually pretty much the same. But the reason, you know, whenever I was thinking about what I would share and use as a model for this process, what I'm about to share with you is like the furthest thing from my, from my mind for some reason. And that's, that's mainly because it's something that's still unfolding. It's something that I'm very much still in. And um, for me and for a lot of us, it's easier to talk about the past. Because, and I enjoy doing that. I enjoy um, sharing those types of stories and hearing other people share their stories of wisdom and what they've learned. You know, it's a beautiful thing. It assigns meaning and purpose to what we've been through, right? But so much easier to say, you know, I can stand here in front of you 
all strong and powerful in the present and say, once upon a time, you know, th there's a story where I was, um, I was confused and I was weak and I was vulnerable. And, but that was then, I was in that cocoon phase, you know, and, and look at me now, I'm a beautiful butterfly, right? Um, but time and time again, I've been, I'm being called to share from this place, um, from a very real and authentic place of, of uncertainty, of, of vulnerability. And I'm finding that there's a lot of power in that. There's a lot of power in speaking from that real authentic place and even through, you know, a shaky voice or what have you and, um, and sharing that. So this today is very much part of my transformation and it's a big part of my healing. And I feel incredibly blessed just to have this opportunity. So my story, I'll start by giving you some brief history. In 2002, I was 22 years old, and I was diagnosed with papillary carcinoma, also known as thyroid cancer. Um, I was treated at MD Anderson Cancer Center. They removed my thyroid and um, gave me a pretty high dose of radioactive iodine, which was to um, kill any residual cancer cells that, that weren't removed from, from the surgery. Um, but that, that was pretty much it. It was, it was maybe took six months. I was declared cancer-free and uh, was able to move on with my life, and I did. I moved to San Antonio and started going to school. Until three years later, in uh, 2005, I was 25 years old, and um, my babies were really small. They're not, they're not small anymore. They're right here. Say hi to the good people. So I was 25 years old, and um, I was diagnosed with leukemia. When I went into the doctor, went to the hospital, they informed me that my blood was 92% cancerous, that without treatment right away, I only had about two to four weeks to live. So uh, we got started on that chemo pretty quickly. The first round of chemo, the protocol, um, I had an allergic reaction to it a pretty near-death experience. So then we had to resort to the second-line chemo, um, which was experimental at the time. They gave me something called arsenic trioxide. Arsenic, what, you know, what's in rat poison. But, um, and I took that five days a week. So it was kind of like a job. You know, Monday through Friday, I reported to the to University Hospital, the Cancer Center. Remember that, Kristen? <laughs> cancer sister, strong woman. But I did that for about 10 months, and, and I got additional intermittent chemotherapy throughout. And by the time it was all said and done, I'd received and endured about 150 doses of intravenous chemo into my body. Um, again, I was um, thankfully declared in remission. I was given two more years of oral maintenance chemo, and I had about, through the, through the course of it all, maybe about six different types of chemo. And you know, you achieve remission, and then and then you you move on with your life, and that's that's like a whole other story of transformation because one simply doesn't just move on with their life after something like that. Um, but we'll fast forward to today, and that's just a little background to tell you about why I'm here now, experiencing what I'm experiencing. So today, I you know I'm blessed to be able to stand before you and, and say that I've been cancer free for 10, 10 years. Thank you. Over the past couple years, however, um, I've started to um, feel sick again, to not feel well. And just my, I could tell my general well of, uh, sense of well-being was off. Um, started having a lot of digestive, gi digestive issues. And despite my attempt to maintain a healthy weight, um, that has fluctuated quite a bit. I would go to the doctor uh, reluctantly, and I never could really get a clear diagnosis. So, you know, they threw out things like maybe candida or um, maybe high stress and, you know, the, the weight fluctuation, they attributed that to not having a thyroid, which is true. I mean, that definitely is, is a factor. But I made some lifestyle changes, and, um, and it did seem to help for, for a time. But this January, um, things started getting really, really bad. I started feeling really sick, um, experiencing a lot of swelling in my body. I started having um, headaches, joint pain, some confusion, 
um, a little bit of slurred speech, uh, which I, I, still, um, I still do at times. And, and I speak, you know, I do public speaking for, for a living, so that constantly is something I'm trying to work through. But one day um, around in, in January of this year, I was doing my yoga practice, and when I went into a forward fold, I had a pretty sharp pain um, right where my spleen is. And I got up and, you know, kind of made some adjustments and, and tried to go back in. And it was there again. So for that week following, I was very aware that any time um, my abdomen was restricted, uh, I would experience something between discomfort and, and pain. And I don't like to go to the doctors. I, I really do, you know, he self-healing mostly. But one night... Uh, during my meditation and, and doing my self-energy work, I checked in with my guides, and it was confirmed to me that there's a serious imbalance in my body. There's something going on. It's serious, and I did, in fact, need to, to go in. So that night, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I, um, I went, took myself to the emergency room by myself because that's how I roll. <laughs> and, you know... I was prepared for, to hear the C word again. In fact, um, spleen pain, and the, the only reason I really know where, what that is and where it is in my body, is because that was one of the side of, or one of the symptoms, the first symptoms I had whenever I had leukemia. So, you know, it was a good indication for me. I went in, I wasn't really scared. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to, some answers and to know how to move forward. But I so was not prepared for what I was about to hear. I was not prepared for the doctor to come back and tell me that at 35 years old, my liver is severely scarred. And they call it cirrhosis of the liver. So there's liver disease, and then there's in-stage liver disease, and that's called cirrhosis. And at the time, I, th I thought only people much older than me who drank at a level of alcoholism got cirrhosis of the liver. And in my mind, you know, that night in the emergency room, I was super confused. My mind went back to the first and only reference I had for, for cirrhosis. And it was the second grade, and uh, there was an assembly. Do you all remember those in school? Um, you got out of class because, you know, they had a guest speaker, they had a message that you probably didn't care about, but you were happy because you got to get out of class anyway. Well, um, this woman did definitely had my attention. She was there to, to talk about her alcoholism and how that, um, that resulted in cirrhosis of the liver. And at second grade, you know, I would, probably wouldn't have remembered the word cirrhosis, but she made it really easy to remember. She said, you'll remember because you take scissors and, a ro and roses, put it together, and it's cirrhosis. I, I don't know. I, it worked because I remembered it. Um, but I remember her talking to us and just really scraping the crap out of us <laughs> as kids, um, telling us about her disease and telling us how, um, how she suffered daily and um, explaining to us that she would continue to suffer this way daily until she either got a liver transplant or she died. And I remember also feeling so very bad for her because she looked scary. Her skin and her eyes were completely yellow. Um, you get jaundice. And although the rest of her body um, seemed pretty thin, her abdomen was distended and, and ballooned, you know. Um, and again, that's, that's what I, where I went, where my mind went that night in the emergency room. So needless to say, I was pretty, pretty freaked out. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about what one does with this type of information. And if we revisit the concept that Angel was talking about um, as being a spiritual being living a human experience, if you choose to see, see it that way. For me, this doesn't, this doesn't mean that simply recognizing that means that you get some shortcut and you get to instantly transcend the human experience, right? So I've tried that before. I've tried to take that shortcut. And, and kind of like Angel said, I just found that the situation wouldn't quite shift or move until I actually went through it and did it, you know, did it the right way to learn those lessons. 
for some challenges, I think it is possible. I think that simply that awareness um, helps to put things in perspective. And then, you know, the, you, you see very clearly what the illusions are. They fall away and that sort of thing. But for these bigger experiences, these really profound lessons, I think we may need to go through them. Um, and I think we want to because in my experience, there's a lot of lessons throughout, throughout the experience. And I don't, you don't necessarily have to, it doesn't have to be something like my experience. It doesn't have to be a major illness. Um, and you know, you get to decide which is which. Every, it's, when you boil it down, it's basically all grief, right? So for me, it's like grieving my health. But grief appears in many different ways for many different reasons, and everybody responds to it differently. So I say that nobody gets to decide what constitutes an obstacle for you and how fast and how gracefully you're supposed to transcend it. That's for you to figure out. I kind of worry that there's too many messages out there in the world, and unfortunately there's a lot of spiritual um, teachings that maybe perhaps are taken out of context, but they're made, they make people feel bad about their pain, and they make them feel bad about being in their darkness for some time. So based on my current understanding and, and through a little bit of my studies about energetic balance of the body, mind, and spirit, it's my belief that um, an imbalance occurs at a spiritual level first. So if left at that level, if left imbalanced, um, it'll go a little bit deeper and it'll start affecting us at a mental level. So when that happens, we might experience things like um, stress, anxiety, depression, um, insomnia, lots of different ways we can experience that. And then if we, don't, if we don't address it and we leave that imbalance there, then it has the potential to manifest into some type of physical illness. And, you know, doctors have many labels for that, right? So are we all kind of predisposed to some medical something or other? Sure, I, I think so. And were tons of toxins pumped right into my central line here? Yeah, of course. Um, that happened too. But I maintain that these imbalances are just ways for, for those lessons to work their way into our human experiences. You don't necessarily have to believe or agree with that trajectory. Um, you don't have to see it the way I do. But I think we can all agree that when situations are there, inevitably they're not going away, that perhaps... Um, Perhaps there's lessons to be learned from them, right? And maybe there's some change. Maybe we're being called to make some big changes to transform. And it would probably benefit us to answer that call. So where are the lessons and, and who's got the answers, right? That's what we all want to know. In my current situation, I'm sorry, but all the positive Facebook memes in the world don't do anything for me. That's for you, Claire. <laughs> Creating a vision board, you know, putting, putting all of these things um, that are outside of me, it, it's not too helpful. I'm not finding my answers in an Eckhart Tolle book, and, and I'm really not even, the answers aren't sitting in my favorite spiritual community each Sunday you know, here, Celebration Circle, which I love. All of these things serve their purpose, and they're great tools. Um, and one of them offers community, a sense of community, which is, which is wonderful. But all of these things are concepts, and they're ideas that you still have yet to do something with. So even the things I'm, I'm going to tell you today, and, you know, they might be making some sense to you. Or maybe you think I'm crazy, and if that's true, don't, I just have a few more minutes, don't worry. <laughs> but again, it's, it's the info that you must then take and do something with. Otherwise, it, they just remain ideas or concepts. My deepest transformative experiences usually take place in private. It's when I get real quiet and I allow myself to feel the feelings. 
I know that when I'm clear and I'm present to my feelings, that that's when I can hear Creator much more clearly. In theory, it sounds simple, you know, to just feel your feelings, but it's really, it's really not that easy. One of my teachers reminds me that it's counterintuitive. We're hardwired to run from pain. Something hurts, something's unpleasant. We want to reach for the light. We want to get out of the darkness, go to the light. And that's still the goal. The goal is the same, but there's a process to it. And, you know, there's so many, there's so many messages, like I said earlier, in the world telling us that it's not okay to be in those feelings, that you're not supposed to. You're supposed to just mind over matter, right? Um, and then it's not always easy either because other people, there's that fear of rejection, right, other, if, if we're in that space. Um, because other people are, aren't used to doing that for themselves perhaps, so they're ill-equipped to really hold space for you to do that. And the day I was diagnosed, I actually did, um, I actually did try to share my experience with somebody and be, be in that place which, like I told you when I started, um, is a, being vulnerable is a struggle for me. So it took a lot to do that. And this person, um, this person, don't think they meant harm. I know they didn't, but they said, "Wow, I'm surprised you're, I'm surprised you're reacting this way. Um, you appear to be much stronger than you actually are." <laughs> And I thought, nah, you know, he obviously doesn't know what to do with a wild woman. So he was, <laughs> he was ill-equipped for sure. <laughs> but I'll move on and tell you, uh, it's, it's a deep process and, you know, I'm trying to condense it for the time that we have here. But I'll share some things with you that I've encountered while doing this deeper work of connecting my healing um, from an, an emotional place. And like I said before, I, I use this approach time and time again, but this particular time, this particular situation, I really feel like I'm, I'm starting to transcend some major barriers that have followed me for lifetimes. Um, and that's, that's why I, I felt like this is the one, you know, I wanted to share with you guys. So like Angel said earlier, one of the first things you're going to encounter are your fears, Right. And I told you whenever I heard the news, I felt really scared. But I didn't know what that fear was, was about or where it was coming from until I sat down and I allowed it to be there. I allowed it to, to speak to me. And I found that, um, I mean, the most obvious thing would be like, well, maybe you're probably afraid to die, right, That's for some people. And I realized that, you know, based on my understanding of what death is and what death isn't, that I, there that's really not a place of fear for me. For me, it's just another form of transformation. What I did realize, and only when I, when I, I listened to the fear, was that I'm more afraid of living sick. I'm afraid of being that woman that I, I saw in second grade. Um, so once I identified the fear and where it was coming from, it became clear what I could do to hope maybe restore some sense of peace and some sense of balance back in my life. So I was in to see my Ayurvedic practitioner like that within days. And together we devised a very focused plan on how I would restore balance in my body and my mind spirit. And I found this before that once you, once you identify those feelings and where they're coming from, then the action becomes very clear. But sometimes we are trying to approach it from a mental level. What do I do? What can I do? You know, we're going in circles and we're not really taking the time out to check in and figure out what, what's actually going on with us. And I don't know if any of you know um, what Ayurveda is, but if you don't, I encourage you to find out. But food is one of the aspects, it's one of the biggest as aspects of it. It's eating in a way that's detoxifying your body and using food as medicine. So it takes a lot of discipline because disease, and it, it kind of sounds like the ego the angel was talking about, disease craves to grow. Imbalance craves to grow. So that means that the very things that I'm craving 
are the exact things I have to stay away from if I want to restore balance and, and overcome this disease process. And that's something I've struggled with my whole life, and I, I know I'm not alone there. So it takes a lot of discipline. And meanwhile, because I am eating the best things for me, I'm starting to purge the toxins that, that have been stored in my body um, because my liver hasn't been able to do it properly. So if any of you have ever done like a serious detox, um, you know that that, that doesn't mean, just mean headaches and body sweats and um, like some flu-like symptoms. It also means a purging of emotions, right? So those emotions, the emotions I spoke about earlier that perhaps were hanging around at a spiritual, mental level that I, I didn't know about and I didn't process, and so now they're, they're here, they're in my body. Just, they're just begging to be seen, to be validated, to be, um, so that they could shift and, and move on out. So here I am, I'm physically ill, um, and I, I will liken it to some of the cancer struggle. That's how bad it felt. But at the same time that my body is physically ill and struggling, I'm being hit with a whole slew of emotions. So it's no longer just the fear. So what do I do? I have emotions. I go back into the darkness. I bravely go back and I, I listen. I, and I want to see what they're there for. What are they, what's the message? What's the learning? And from my studies, I also understand that um, emotions, ha different organs store different emotions, different places in the body. So the liver is the house for anger. So I went to my liver and I gave it a voice. It's weird, right, to talk to your organs? You try it. You should, yeah, some of us, it's not weird to some. But I gave, I gave it a voice and I just, you know, it's a very, it's a very deep, quiet, personal journey. What are you here to, what are you upset about? What's there? And I open the doors, and oh my God, talk about some anger. Everything from childhood trauma all the way to more recent stuff. Stuff that needed to be processed. These are things that I haven't, you know, I don't think about on a daily basis, if ever. But they're there, obviously. They're working in the background, and they're affecting my life. So one of the other things through this work that I, I've been able to identify and discover is, um, is limiting beliefs. And we all know that limiting beliefs don't serve our higher purpose. So we want to identify them, and we want to redefine what we believe and I arrive at that, at that um, with simple statements, and then I kind of examine what, what's going on in my body. So for example, I'll play with the statement, um, I'm damaged goods. So on a mental level, I know that that's not true. I know that I'm not damaged goods. But I suspect that at an emotional level, there's a little bit of disconnect from that mental knowing. So. I'll take that statement and I'll play with the opposite of it. So I'm damaged goods, the opposite being I am whole and complete. So the work looks like this. Close my eyes, go back in, and I say the statement, I am whole and I am complete. And I feel it out and I look, I scan my body for resistance and for tension. And if you, you've done this practice, you know that you'll feel it. Maybe it's here in the solar plexus, you know. Maybe I say I'm whole and complete, and I feel that tension right there. So I sit with it, and I allow it to speak to me. Then I try it again, and I just kind of follow it around the body. What it does when you see something, when you expose something, it's, it's a release. It really does dissipate. It sounds scary because you're like, I don't want to spend my, you know, night, my evening 
sitting there feeling all crappy, right? But I promise you, that's how it dissipates. That's how you get it to shift and to move. And of course, I didn't make this stuff up, right? <laughs> it, this stuff has been around. And that, that particular one is um, it's called cognitive interweaving, and they use it in therapy a lot. And, but it's, just, it's a very simple but very effective tool. I tell you what, this work, it really does require the big guns. Some parts of this process have been so difficult. And through some parts of this process, I've never wanted like a bottle of wine and a cake more in my life. And not notice I didn't say a glass and a slice. <laughs> I want the whole bottle and the whole cake. <laughs> And I've never, I've never identified as being an alcoholic or a binge eater, but um, it's been very interesting for me um, in doing this. It really does expose, and when you're, when you're looking at it this deeply and you're also exercising the discipline of I'm going to make good decisions and do what's good for me, it really will expose um, the, the many things that I tend to use as an escape from my feelings. So you start to learn about yourself, and you start to see that. And there's, you know, not everybody, not everybody goes to drugs and alcohol. There's so many socially acceptable ways to distract yourself and to escape. You know, there's social media. That's another one for me. Uh, social hour, serving others to the point where you're not serving yourself anymore. And that sounds like, that sounds like it should be good, right? It's noble. Well, it's not. Work, some people become workaholics, even, even exercise. I mean, you're, you're not going to find me escaping there, but, <laughs> but I've seen it. But the good news, I know I haven't made this process sound like a whole lot of fun, uh, but the good news is I'm feeling so much better. I'm feeling better than I have in many, many years because of all this release that's taking place. It's through my holistic and my spiritual practices that I've actually resolved most of the symptoms that I was feeling, and I've, I've, I've shed like probably close to 30 pounds, a ton of emotional baggage, and all of this without utilizing any Western medicine whatsoever. It was the, <laughs> thank you. It was the, uh, the treatment from the thyroid cancer that caused the leukemia, and the treatment from the leukemia that has me now with, with um, with a damaged liver. I'm not here to go into all that, but if you ever want to go to lunch, I have a lot to say about it. <laughs> so through this work, it's also important for me to be in compassion and gratitude for all that is, for all that is. So I say thank you to those few people in my life that can hold some serious space for me, and you know who you are that can hold some serious space for, for what I'm going through without judgment. I say thank you to my guides, my teachers, my ascended masters. Thank you to God, to Goddess. Thank you to my liver for working so hard, even though it's, it's had to do so much. Thank you to my spleen for stepping in and, and assisting um, existing the liver and even thank you to those extra fat cells that have been you know storing the toxins so that they didn't overload my bloodstream and, and kill me I no longer need you anymore you can go away <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to, thank you to all of this human form I have learned and I'm continuing to learn a lot about myself through this process it's still un unfolding I'll be 36 in like a week or so, and, um, and I have cirrhosis of the liver. That's, that's a hard pill to swallow. There's still so much uncertainty in my life and in what the future holds exactly, but as long as I'm here in this human experience, I'm going to make it worth it. I'm going to make these experiences worth reflecting light and learning about my spiritual journey. Because that's what I am.
It takes some courage not to take the pills that, that they prescribe. But if history would repeat itself, and I went that route, I have no doubt that the prescriptions, the pills would just increase, and they would include things like depression medicine and anti-anxiety pills and all this stuff, because only I can treat this at an emotional, spiritual level. The pills, and they are, they are useful. I'm not knocking Western medicine um, completely. They are useful. But I'm saying there's this whole other part of the work that is presenting, being presented through these obstacles that we have to look at. This is work that I also do um, in, my, in my practice as a spiritual and life coach. Um, I, I have somebody that helps me do this work. Um, if any of you feel called or, or would like to be supported in that way, you know, I hope you'll get with me, and I'd, I'd love to, to be with you in that. So a very good friend uh, who's a gifted speaker, very powerful speaker, once told me about speaking to people. You know, we have, like, this short amount of time to try to make an impact and share all this information. And he said that people will rarely come away remembering everything you said, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. So if you don't, you know, even if you don't take away um, all of my experience or the process or whatnot, I hope that you come away feeling validated. I hope that you feel um, seen. I hope that you know that there's beauty in your darkness and it's okay to be there. And I hope that you know, especially when in those times when you need it most, that you have everything within you in that very moment to learn these lessons, to navigate through it. You, you within yourself, have everything you need to make it through. Thank you.